Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Edgar Heba Burns. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, can we start with the PowerPoint, um, Christian? Yeah, I wanted to uh, begin with the image and start speaking about our topic today. Uh, uh, Spirit Citizen is um, uh, my title for this this uh, sharing. And I, I come forward uh, from the prairie, and we're, we're looking at the sun setting uh, west of Oklahoma City. Our reservation is uh, about 30 miles west of Oklahoma City, all, then all the way to Texas. It's like one, kind of like one quarter of uh, Oklahoma, uh, the, 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 the first reservation that we had. So, so the, this kind of um, image of a very flat space is uh, a point I want to make and carry through throughout the talk. It's been something that I, I, I've been look, looking at for over 30 years, 40 years, and um, uh, it, it, it really has a lot to do with my work, the flatness. So just bear that in mind, okay? Okay, next, please. I dedicate the talk today to indigenous women, and they've, they've carried us so far so it's it's so amazing to have their um, mentorship. This is my grandmother, uh, Alice, lightning woman, heap of birds. She was also a howling crane. Uh, she's standing there probably in the 1940s, maybe, um, on the reservation, holding her daughter, Dorothy. Uh, they both passed on now. But my grandmother, uh, lightning woman, was very important to me. And my daughter, uh, Desva, uh, she has the same name as Lightning Woman. You'll see her later. Okay, next, please. <clears throat> uh, this is a, one of my favorite photographs. I just began to re-include it into my talk. Um, you might recognize a young man. He looks a lot like me. I don't know where he came from, but he's a young guy there. But this is a photograph. Uh, I'm joking, but uh, this is a photograph from uh, in the 80s, and that's Lightning Woman standing there in front of me. So the time has passed, uh, moved ahead. And she was very strong to stand with me, literally. And that's my, my word text piece, uh, folkloric distraction, unlike a folkloric distraction. And we did this shot with a, with a view camera. So it took hours to make this one photograph, black and white, like eight by 10 plate. Um, but anyway, she was there uh, supporting me as she had all her life. And uh, and my point was, we're unlike a folkloric distraction, which is much like many of the tourist things you see Native people used for, and we're unlike that. Okay, next, please. Uh, Lightning Woman was married to, <coughs> uh, her husband was Guy Heap of Birds, and he's the little boy on the far left. So again, we're kind of moving through time. Uh, his, his father was Black Wolf Heap of Birds, holding the pipe, and Grace Big Bear, a uh, matriarch in the center, and his, uh, her, her children. Um, and Black Wolf was the son of many magpies, who was one of the four principal chiefs of the Cheyenne Nation. And so he became a leader of the Elk Warrior Society, ceremonial society in a medicine way. And now I'm one of the leaders of that society. Okay, next please. I want to talk a bit about mentorship in terms of um, an artist and uh, native culture and other ways too, non-native culture. But uh, this is a sculpture by Black Bear Boson, Keeper of the Plains is the title. And it's at the confluence of the Little and Big Arkansas Rivers in Wichita, Kansas. It's a steel sculpture about 50 feet tall. Okay, next please. I was so fortunate to have uh, Black Bear Boson as a mentor in Wichita, Kansas. I grew up there. Uh, my father went to Wichita from Western Oklahoma to work in an aircraft factory. That's many native tribes. There's 40 tribes, almost 40 or 39 in Oklahoma Indian Territory. Many of them went north to go work in the factories after the Cold War um, and during the World War II. Um, but Black Bear 
was a very important leader in the community. And he showed us how to be uh, kind of dignitaries or, or offerings, uh, kind of people that, that help society. Uh, and he was a great artist as well. So I got to see him make murals as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is one of his most famous paintings, most notable paintings. It's called Prairie Fire, and it's in a collection in Tulsa. Uh, and here, too, he has so much grace and so much, uh, you know, will to create an image of life that was true. And so his work there presents the fire and the sky, the prairie fire, but also the animals and the people fleeing the fire. And the animals and people have the same status. But also the fire is beautiful. So he felt that all these things were living beings, and he made that position known. Next, please. Um, this is my first painting uh, when I was uh, uh, a college student at the University of Kansas in 1972 to 76. Uh, this painting was probably made around 1974, and uh, it's six foot square. Uh, and it's critical on canvas, but I, I wanted to again go back, you know, and just mentally go back to the image of that, that horizon. So that I was making these images, and I made, I had many paintings that I created, um, and they were all sort of abstract paintings. But uh, that kind of angular nature, the flatness, the lines, the sky, the earth, uh, that was in my mind, you know, without even trying to organize it. It was just something innate in me. Next, please. Um, also, another mentor <clears throat> I encountered this time at the University of Kansas was a fellow student. His name is Don Secondine, uh, Atlanta Lenape, Delaware artist from Oklahoma. And um, he was a, a figurative painter. But uh, he had studied with Dr. Dick West Sr. at Haskell Institute in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and he'd been involved uh, deeply, more deeply than I at the time in a tribal uh, community. Uh, we, we both were enrolled in a landscape painting class and um, we didn't wanna do easel paintings. We went out two or three times a week with all the other students in the countryside around Lawrence, Kansas. Um, but we ended up making earthworks. And so this is a tall uh, tree limb uh, that we created and we painted the, the middle of it. We put cedar in the center for spirits and we put at the top a uh, horse tail. Next, please. And the horse tail was to mimic a woman's hair blowing in the wind. Um, and his uh, mother-in-law had died who was a Chano uh, from Anadarko, Oklahoma. She, uh, um, she died and her, her, her daughter was his wife. Um, and so it was a memorial to his, his uh, mother-in-law. And, and I just show this too, because certainly I've become very prominent in my focus in my, in my practice has often been memorials. And this was in 1974. Uh, and I would move ahead later, it would take maybe 10, 15 years to, to make many memorials. Okay, next please. Uh, so I was involved with the sculpture outdoors, the painting, but I also got involved with uh, found objects. And I, believe, and I really feel strongly that artists need to work with almost anything that they can touch and to explore materials, you know, different process. Uh, works as well. This is a construction. Um, it's about eight foot by seven foot tall, and it's made of all kinds of found objects, a dog house, rope, uh, roofing, roofing paper, tar, and, but I still had the angles going on, the horizon, uh, but it was very much about the materials themselves. Okay, next please. That was my senior a um, body of work, those constructions, <clears throat> and I received a scholarship. I was admitted to the Royal College of Art in Knightsbridge, London. This is the uh, Albert Memorial in Royal Albert Hall, um, right in Kensington Park. And I moved to London from Wichita, a big shocking experience to have grown up in Wichita, be from Western Oklahoma, and land in the middle of London. Uh, 
but I, I ended up really, really enjoying it, uh, enjoying Europe. Uh, I was all over Europe traveling as well. Uh, the Royal College of Art is right next to the Royal Albert Hall here. Um, so London was very important to me, but it really showed me the diversity of the world because London has so many uh, kind of negative experiences with the colonies that they, they bullied around the world. So uh, London is very cosmopolitan in terms of all the countries that have come back, you know, the citizens of other countries that were once colonies. So I had a lot of friends and very, very rich culture in London. Okay, next please. I returned back to Oklahoma. This is a tree on top of Mount Scott down by Lawton where they had Geronimo in prison uh, by Fort Seal. And so uh, my life at, after London would be a uh, blend of leaving and returning to Oklahoma. And uh, I continue to do that uh, to this day. Next, please. Also, my son Wookim uh, took that photograph. Uh, this uh, image is um, a moccasin pattern. It's a serigraph, and it was taken. I made the image after my grandmother, lightning woman, her moccasin, uh, actually the actual beaded piece she would create as a pattern. She kept it with her. Um, she made a lot of moccasins for the tribe. Uh, and I did a, a residency short few week or so with the tribe on the reservation in the summer of uh, 70, 76, uh, made this print, but I would carry it with me. I went to Philadelphia to the uh, Tata School of Art and I would take this with me. Okay, next please. I was fairly confused. I think moving also brings a lot of confusion. It can be very enlightening, but it's also confusing to sort it out. So my art practice uh, after London was fairly uh, lost and I came home to make the moccasin piece. And then I had the shape in the center of this, this uh, a gouache painting about 40 inches across. Um, but I was still pursuing those uh, kind of geometrical paintings, but they weren't very lively in terms of their history. There was sort of a Frank Stella-ish kind of uh, image. So I wanted to have them battle each other, fight. And so I put the, the, the modern painting in the middle of the moccasin. And then pretty soon the moccasin took over. Okay, next please. And so I became politicized. I became uh, very much involved with identity. This is about a seven foot drawing. There's two sections of it. <clears throat> it would say Haskell KU, Death Song, Natural Backwards. This was made in graduate school, probably 1977. Uh, exciting time, the Talking Heads were the big music craze. We were dance in studios with the Talking Heads. I came out of London where the Sex Pistols were very powerful. Francis Bacon was painting in Chelsea. So it was a very dynamic time. Uh, at the top of the, of the drawing on the right uh, are the Philadelphia 76ers basketball team. And I went to all the games uh, in Philly where the cheap seats were. Now I'm a, I have season tickets to the Oklahoma City Thunder. So I still keep up with my basketball. Okay, next please. Uh, for my master's degree, the MFA degree at Tata School of Art, um, it was a breakthrough exhibit for me, very important exhibit. I showed a variety of works in two galleries, but there were no Cheyennes to come to my exhibit. It was too far away. And so uh, I ended up deciding to write my names, my family names in the gallery. So as I said earlier, my grandmother, Lightning Woman, her maiden name was Howling Crane. So I wrote that in the gallery with die cut letters. And also the old man, uh, the chief, uh, many magpies, I indicated that with his name as well. So I started, I started making these text pieces, kind of works of art in like 1970, 79 when I graduated. Okay, next please. Um, a, a major mentor on the East Coast was Vito Acconci. And you can look him up. Uh, he's one of the most amazing artists anywhere in the world. He's, he's, he's passed on now. But uh, I was hanging up my work about the Washita massacre. You see in the background there, the text pieces. And I literally backed up and I bumped into somebody and it was Vito Acconci. He was hanging up these mask work 
objects uh, in the ceiling. This is in Brooklyn, Ashoka preparing for war with a group material, uh, kind of a collaborative radical group in New York City. I'd come back uh, to the East Coast. I was hung my work there, showed there with Vito. But Vito had come to Tyler when I was a student and he really ignited uh, works about identity and, and sexuality, sensuality. Power, powerful lecture and, and, and helped me great, a great deal. And next, please. Uh, here's a, a large drawing painting I did, eight by eight foot. This was in Philadelphia, um, around 1980, 79, 80. It's called Fort Marion Lizards. And so as I became politicized, I started really uh, unpacking history. And so I certainly found about, found that about the, the prisoners of war after the Washita massacre. And I found a list of the prisoners of war who were taken to Florida from Oklahoma, the Cheyenne uh, prisoners of war. And my name was at the top of the list, Hippo Birds, they called it back then. And so I really started to wonder and started to present ideas about language being a way to empower you or to subdue you. So language was something we had to have power over. And the names is one way to start. Okay, next please. These prisoners of war made art in prison. They were, uh, they were really dominated by the army. They were taken away from their families. They were held hostage uh, in San Augustine, Florida, a place called Fort Marion. Next, please. And I, I really feel strongly that uh, we need to really think about this experience of what they call enemy combatants. We, the Cheyenne had no trials, no real charges. Uh, later, some of them were released. Some of them died on the way, were killed on the way to Fort Marion. And it was kind of a mystery as to what happened to them there. Uh, and, I, and I really bring that up in terms of Guantanamo Bay, Camp X-ray today, what we're doing to people uh, in, in Cuba. Next, please. Um, I came back to Oklahoma, as always. I came back, this is my, another one of my son's photographs, Wood Gimp. Uh, the red earth, very, very uh, reassuring and lovely earth in a sun setting. Next, please. But then I would, I would leave again and go to New York City to create a message on the computer billboard. There was only one billboard in New York City at the time, uh, at, at one Times Square. <clears throat> and artists such as Keith Haring, uh, David Hammonds, uh, Jenny Holzer, uh, Jane Dixon, Billy Sullivan, Hans Hacke, a uh, really amazing group of artists uh, who all became very, very prominent. Uh, we were all young, and this was in, in 1982, but I made a message about the white man. So I would come to New York and talk about the white man rather than come to New York and talk about the Cheyenne. And uh, so the Cheyenne, the Tatistas, said Viho, spider. So Viho is what the white man's called. And then it had about eight different cells of messages about what the spider does. And so um, uh, the main point was that the fencing, the reservations, the trapping, the capturing tendency of the white man uh, became the name Viho, which is spider in Cheyenne. Okay, next please. And I will come back uh, later, this is in 88. Now my first public art piece uh, was for the Public Art Fund in New York City. And uh, I came as, as, as always as a visitor to tribal land as I was welcomed here uh, to, to Paiute country and other nations uh, in, in, in Nevada. I felt that way in 88. I mean, I, I think you have to honor your host, you know, and so I'm not, the Cheyenne don't, don't have New York and they have nothing to do with New York. Um, and so I often go to New York to talk about tribes that are already there. And uh, I reverse New York backwards to have them look at their past differently. And I made 12 panels of New York tribes, but about six were censored by Mayor Koch. So only six were allowed to go up. Next, please. I had a solo show in, in Lower Manhattan by the Whitney Museum uh, like two years ago, or about a year ago. And I was able to bring back all of the names of the tribes, Cayuga, Shinnecock, uh, Onondaga, uh, Seneca, all these different tribal names. And we, and we, and we mounted it in a, a courtyard. Uh, the ones that were censored, we put them back up. Next, please. 
Uh, that project is called Native Hosts, and it's been going on since 88. This is uh, the Spencer Museum at University of Kansas. And I created, I think, five panels for the museum, and then it was acquired by the museum. Uh, so this is a picture of the snow that day when I was there at, at KU going back. Next, please. I've worked in Salt Lake with students. Uh, the students there at the University of, of Utah were very uh, distinct in telling me there's no Ute nation in a sense. The real word is Nuchi. So we put Nuchi up and I made them a panel in front of their uh, student association. Next, please. This is at Crystal Bridges in Arkansas, a very wonderful museum complex. And uh, so I did a series for them as well, Native Hosts, uh, turning Arkansas backwards. And um, this uh, Cheyenne word is a meaning of uh, all of the tribes together. So in a sense, there's many tribes come through territory during time, over time. It's not really like one set nation, really. Uh, so I, I honored all the tribes. And there's seven distinct tribes that I, I brought forward in, in the, there's a kind of a parquet in the woods here. Next, please. I did do a series for the, uh, uh, the Jacobson House where the Kiowa Five lived. You might know the Kiowa Five, the painters, Kiowa Six with the lady. Um, and uh, Sooner is written backwards. As a professor at the University of Oklahoma, you get really sick and tired of hearing about Sooners and Oklahoma in general, in general but uh, so Cheyenne is your host. Okay, next, please. And I was very happy to work in, in the Virgin Islands. I travel to the Caribbean often. I have friends and artists there and I get lectured there as well. So Taino, <clears throat> to challenge the tourists that come to the Virgin Islands is very important and to bring up the tribal, tribal losses that we don't really acknowledge. Um, before the middle passage of slavery, <clears throat> there were many, many nations in the Caribbean. Next, please. While there in uh, St. Croix and St. Thomas, I was asked to speak at the state legislature of the Virgin Islands, American Virgin Islands. And I met uh, representatives from the different districts of, of the Virgin Islands and we had a wonderful time together. And uh, we, we were there on, on African Independence Day. Next, please. Uh, the, the series continues. I'm still active with the project uh, all over uh, North America and Canada. So I was in Anchorage recently and they acquired 20 panels uh, for their museum and we had them all up just in the, in the early fall, uh, autumn time, I was in Anchorage, Alaska. Next, please. While there, I made my way up to the, the sound uh, south of uh, of uh, Anchorage and, and one of the most wonderful experiences of my life. So, so along with meeting indigenous people, uh, I would make that a focus and to share with them. But I, I make another focus is to be with a natural world wherever I travel and, and to live, live in, in the natural world myself. Uh, I like being outside, uh, whether it's cold or hot or rainy or snowy, it doesn't really matter. Um, and so this is the glacier coming out of the mountains in Alaska. And we were able to, we went on a boat trip about four hours. Um, and I, we were able to, to bring that ice on board of the, of the craft. And, and, and I could bless myself with this ancient ice, which was just an amazing, amazing privilege to touch this ice. Next, please. I've worked extensively in Africa as well. Um, I've been in South Africa. I had a studio in South Africa. I taught at Michaela's College of Art part of Cape Town University in Cape Town. I also lectured in Johannesburg. I also spoke in Harare uh, at the National Museum, um, but I worked uh, primarily to, to link eagles. Uh, the, on the left of this drawing, of this page is a drawing of the Great Zimbabwe Eagle. And it's, it's an amazing uh, city center, ancient city, much, much like Machu Picchu or, or Chaco Canyon uh, in, in Zimbabwe. So I was there a few times in Zimbabwe and I, I found this eagle and then I linked it up with the Cheyenne Eagle 
on the right. So in America, I, I have to be very, very honest, certainly there's racism from native tribes to other people as well. They're, they're, they fight over the, the lowest rung of the ladder. You know, it's very, very political. Uh, so poverty and disenfranchisement. So there's not always a great uh, awareness or solidarity with African Americans and Native Americans. And, and often on the East Coast, that life is blended over the 500 years of uh, the white man being like in Massachusetts or Rhode Island. So I wanted to have the Eagles get together and, and, and get along together. So we made a project from Africa to uh, Narragansett to Oklahoma. Next, please. There were four artists uh, that participated. Uh, Cynthia Ross Meeks was Hwapa Noag, uh, and uh, in the center is uh, Tall Oak Everett Whedon, who is Narragansett, myself on the left. On the right, uh, Timigosi Guniwe from the townships uh, outside of Cape Town. And so we all made work together about the Eagle speaking together. So it was wonderful to have that experience and to share uh, and come together. We met each other in Rhode Island. It was sponsored by the Rhode Island Museum of Art, uh, RISD, and uh, we showed it there together. Then we took it back to Cape Town and we did work with children on the Narragansett Reservation and took it back to Cape Town. So it was great to be traveling with that communication back and forth to the communities. Next, please. And then we have the tree, the juniper tree. Uh, they call it a cedar, but it's really a juniper. And for 10 years, I lived on the reservation uh, proper, uh, 500 acres of land, my great grandmother, Arapaho grandmother, my mother's family, uh, on top of this canyon, uh, no water for many years, no road, no, no bathroom, uh, no electricity. But I hunted with my gun and my dogs and, and lived in the elements, learned a lot about heat and heat and cold and uh, far, uh, gardening and making your life uh, there. But the trees were informing me with my painting. Okay, next please. So the Nuf series was born in a tiny canyon or they would call it a rural, tiny little red rock, uh, about 82. And it really saved me actually going down there and making this a tiny painting eight by 10 inches. And then they've, they've been progressing since 82. This is probably 2010 or 12, uh, maybe three by four feet. They go up to uh, eight by nine feet also. Um, so the NUF series, uh, meaning shine number four, doing something four times. I always create four of them, but the trees have been very, very strong and in, the, in kind of a subliminal presence there. Okay, next please. I travel, as I said, to the tropics, to the Caribbean, but I also travel to Asia. Uh, often I've, I've been uh, in, in uh, Samoa, Western Samoa. My wife and I did work in, in uh, uh, Indonesia, in Java. And um, this is a picture <clears throat> looking back from Lombok, an, an island, uh, to Bali. So that, that is Bali, that volcano is Bali. And so the fish, the reefs, the life, the community, people of color, that sharing, the elders being respected, all those things are wonderful uh, in all the indigenous cultures I, I move inside of. Next, please. Uh, just a couple years ago, I was, I was in uh, Sumatra and um, I met weavers there and they're just so spectacular and brilliant. Uh, and I went to homes and met the artists uh, and then I collected work from their, their weaving uh, practice. So it's so wonderful. Coffee all as well. I mean, just being there, eating the fish, you know, being there uh, on, on the island uh, uh, near Lake Toba. This is the Batak tribe, Batak. Okay, next please. And what that brought me was the reef again. And I snorkeled in the currents off of Lombok and Bali and all these places. And, uh, those, those fish really are a gift uh, to look at, to move with, to be buoyant with. And I, I made many visits to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. I worked in Australia extensively as well. 
and they really gave my my painting a lot of vitality the movement that could be linked back to the trees in a sense but forward to the to the reefs and the the caribbean fish or the asian fish okay next please so that's another nuf series painting uh, i began these with just making a shape and then a shape on top of it shape on top of it so it's almost like a storm brewing uh, there's no drawing involved. It's a very, very direct kind of activity. Next, please. Uh, these are some small ones. I've been, I have a whole series continuing uh, right now, uh, the last 10 years. And they're on wood panel. They're wooden, wooden panels. And they're like 14 by 20 or so inches. Um, and I like the wood because it's it's very uh, durable and traveling but also you get a very sharp articulated mark with your brush and so i've been painting in the tropics now i paint more in the tropics now than in my studio so on the lanai in hawaii and oahu or i'll be i'll be in uh, the big island in december uh, i've been in the dominican republic I, you know i travel in these in these places with my family but i take my painting uh wood panels with me and a little easel and i'll paint on the back porch or wherever and make these so the blue is important to me now uh when you're in the in the ocean next please uh this is a, a more of an archival painting this is from probably like um 95 and uh, i did a big exhibition in australia we brought the work here with aboriginal artists from Adelaide and Sydney, Australia. And I had created four of these Nuf paintings. I still have three of them for collections. I still have three of these, three, I have six altogether. Um, but this is at the St. Louis Museum of Art. And um, uh, it's up, it was up last year. I was there in St. Louis working on another, another piece and they showed me the contemporary gallery. Okay, next please. And I was very proud to see that painting. I was very nervous. But they put it up next to Bryce Martin. Uh, and Bryce, Bryce Martin, you know, I guess one of my most respected painters, uh, not a colleague, but kind of the generation ahead of me. But, uh, but I was happy to say that it held its own in that gallery with Bryce Martin and uh, Joan Mitchell. So the three of us were in the same gallery space in St. Louis. Okay, next please. Um, my, my work at, in my tribe, uh, the ceremonial knowledge, is probably the most, it is the most important thing I do. And I am a, a, a leader in the ceremonial way, uh, the religious way. Um, and I've been taught by elders, and I guess now I'm an elder. I'm 65 years old, and uh, I do take young men through the ceremonies and uh, help with certain uh, affairs in the tribe. This is a medicine wheel, a Bighorn medicine wheel, uh, west of Sheridan, up in the Bighorn Mountains. And so it, it really gives you this perspective of, of how it could be art, could be sculpture, but it's really like a ceremonial uh, scientific instrument of the solstice, regal, the star systems, uh, summer solstice, sunrise, and so on. So that's very important. Next, please. My sculpture in Denver is called Wheel, and it's a monumental 50-foot outdoor sculpture. It took 10 years to build. Uh, and, that, and that particular art practice, I kind of brought together my ceremonial knowledge, the history, the politics, uh, and then creating a new art form, really, with porcelain and steel. Um, but alluding back to the ceremonial medicine wheel and the ongoing uh, Earth Renewal Lodge, where we all practice our religion, uh, the Cheyenne people, uh, and I'm an, I'm an instructor in that lodge on the left. At the top of the lodge are all these cottonwood rafter poles, and those poles reflect the same lines as the stones in the ground on the right, the diagram from the Bighorn Wheel. So that's sort of like the roof of, of the world, uh, very important and very complicated but I'll show you the sculpture. Next, please. This is Wheel in front of the Denver Art Museum. And uh, there are 12 panels or 12 standing trees in the lodge. I omitted two 
so that it wouldn't it wouldn't be offensive to people that practice this religion. So it doesn't function, although people use it for many many great purposes. They have offerings there. Uh, the a Sand Creek Massacre. They have a, a, a annual run that is part of grieving for the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado, and it, it ends here at Wheel in a candlelight vigil. So I, I really have been very proud of how the tribes have used this sculpture, uh, and we're now relocating it to the new front of the museum. And in the back, you see the big silver structure. That's a Lieberskin building of the German architect. And so that's reconfigured the, the opening, uh, the entrance to the museum. And so I, I've uh, been, uh, I've taken over a large piece of land in front of the museum. And when we moved one foot of this 50 foot circle uh, to put into the new spot. So all the tears and prayers that were offered on this land will go back into the new spot uh, and we'll probably commemorate that and maybe like a two years from now next please the biggest responsibility and, and mission for the art is to uh, go forward and to uh, um, share with the youth uh, these ideas and so this is my myself with my daughter desba Lightning Woman Heap of Birds at Wheel, and I'm talking to her about the sculpture, showing her the sculpture. I work with other many uh, youth from the Cheyenne tribe, Cheyenne Rappo tribe there too. Okay, next please. I was in uh, Beijing, at Beijing Normal University, <clears throat> and the student there made me a wonderful poster for my lecture there in Beijing. She used the sculpture wheel as the kind of the prototype to make this wonderful poster. So, so China was important for me to go and visit. And I went to Tiananmen Square as well. Next, please. But a big part of Tiananmen Square was my piece that I had created in, in 89 uh, for what happened at Tiananmen Square. But this was a, a four foot poster that I created in New York City that was shown at the Hong Kong Art Center. But I really made it a point to share that with the students there at, at Beijing normal because they had brought out the Statue of Liberty and part of that defiance to the Chinese government. But the Statue of Liberty in America had this back turned toward all the Indians. So I, I wanted to say, don't trust Miss Liberty. Next, please. Uh, the, the most joyous day of my life, one of them has been to work with the tribal elders on my reservation, Shawn Arapaho people. Uh, in Watonga, Oklahoma, and we have a very good elder care program. And so they gathered 250 elders uh, in this big community hall where we'd have powwows. And I made the medicine wheel paintings with everybody that was there with canvas, acrylic paint. My mother was there, my sister was there. So it was wonderful to be with everybody and to create this art activity. Okay, next please. Uh, these are shine moccasins. And I mentioned the piece I did in St. Louis, St. Louis Museum of Art. Uh, I was commissioned to new, do a new piece for their native gallery. And uh, it's a temporary piece. It shouldn't even need a home. I'm hoping to bring it uh, somewhere uh, in Oklahoma. Um, and so the next slide should be more of the formation. Next, please. So this is a, a, a plan. We, we, we had the moccasins on the floor and I used uh, this image of all the many, many issues, uh, examples from our Shine Arapaho newspaper. And so we had them scanned, made a big collage, but I wanted to really focus on the deaths. There have been many, many uh, uh, unfair deaths with some children being murdered by foster parents, non-native parents. Uh, police killing young Cheyenne men in their homes, white police killing Cheyenne men. And so I'm, I really wanted to make that known and make that be the platform for the dancing around dance over these stories. Okay, next please. And one of the young men that was murdered, uh, he was murdered in Clinton, Oklahoma, and his name is uh, Mahavist. Mahavist good blanket. And I danced with his father in the ceremony. We were brothers in the ceremony. And they came into his kitchen and shot him like five times uh, in the kitchen. And he, he, was, he was bipolar. He had some problems. 
but they called the police instead of the police helping him they killed him in in their home a Cheyenne home so I really already uh, mourn for that loss of that young man uh, Mahavist and next please and his story is in the in the top left uh, of this panel of this uh, wall piece uh, and then a young girl was killed uh, by her foster parents or non-native parents uh, so there, there's three or four uh, deaths of young people in the in the stories, but also good stories about Elder Day or powwow time or birthdays. And so we we danced together. You know, we danced with the youth of small moccasins, old moccasins, people, elders. We danced together in this circle, uh, this hoop. Next, please. Uh, that dance is is like moving in a sense. And so I, can we go back? Go one more. Yeah, uh, so we, we move, but many many people have have come to Oklahoma, uh, in not in a voluntary way. And so the Trail of Tears ended in Oklahoma, and so many tribes came from the southeast. Uh, and this is a, a piece about the Trail of Tears, and it was done in Atlanta, where the tribes came from, uh, the the uh, Creek, Uchi, Choctaw, Chickasaw. And I made them uh, in Atlanta, like no parking signs. And I put them up downtown Atlanta, Peachtree Street. And it's almost like saying your parking time is over. You need to leave. <laughs> now, the white man needs to go home. You know that uh, your meter ran out. And so I made, the, I made about maybe 10 series of these signs and put them all over Atlanta. Uh, recently they were shown at PS1 MoMA in New York City. Okay, next please. Uh, back at home, again, back Oklahoma, uh, I work with tribes from the, the Trail of Tears, uh, Yuchi tribes, uh, Creek tribes, uh, Cherokee tribes, Shan Garshorn's in the center who just passed as an artist. She's uh, Cherokee. Joe Dale Tate Nevacoya next to her on, on the left. <coughs> uh, uh, Yuchi, his brother, Richard Ray Whitman on the far left with a cowboy hat on and braids. On the far right, myself, and then next to me, uh, Patricia Mousetrail Russell, a Cheyenne priestess lady from the ceremony and a very excellent beadwork artist. So we, I organized a cooperative on, my, on, the, on the reservation, but also in the city, Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And we worked together, we painted together, we lectured together. Next, please. So it was about you know making our own way and a lot of the work wasn't really being represented well as far as being have about identity or politic or history. So we had to make our own group. And this is a book that I edited called Makers uh, that has uh, poetry, photography, beadwork, and all these works inside from the artists I showed you. Next, please. Uh, last summer, I worked in uh, Vermilion, South Dakota, and I do uh, projects with youth as well as elders. Uh, these are all, uh, voting signs or uh, yard signs and so I worked with them only for like four or five days it was a summer institute uh, in at the University of South Dakota and so I'll show you some of their work it was a great great outcome next please these are mainly high school students and a few a few uh, college age students all native uh, young young people and they made their own messages and I had them fabricated like in one day I helped edit some of them, you know, present them to the computer lab. And then we put a big circle out, a 50 foot circle in front of the art school. And I made some myself. Next, please. So these are all of their messages, uh, not, not a censored or anything, just whatever they wanted to say. I respect, you know, their creativity. And, uh, and they, they, had, they had much to say. They, they, it wasn't hard to encourage them to go forward. Really wonderful. Next, please. Uh, this student is at, student at Yale University. I gave a talk at Yale uh, last year and she was in attendance and also she's from South Dakota. Next, please. A Navajo artist. So, uh, Emanuelato, chief, Navajo chief, um, noted in the, in the piece. Next, please. 
Uh, this is a very recent project. This is uh, with uh, Art in General, which is a gallery in New York City, artist run gallery space, and then the MENA Urban Projects. And uh, these are vote signs for the election. And they made about 50 of these. Different artists created their own. And you can actually, I think you can buy one, one of these for, an, for the benefit auction or something. Or you can actually go to the website and print, print it yourself as well. Uh, so I made this message, uh, don't smile for racism, vote. Okay, next please. And then this is a very, very recent effort as well. This is just met, put up last week in Fresno, California. I'm working also with uh, a group called Four Freedoms. I do a lot of work with uh, collaborative artist groups uh, internationally and nationally. And so we made a series of billboards all across America, maybe 40 billboards, 40 artists. Um, this was in Fresno, California, my message, uh, which my wife helped to actually create the layout, Shanna, Catching People Birds, uh, and um, a message about, about the immigration crisis uh, in, in America. This is called Four Freedoms is a group. You can, you can look at them up on the internet too, Four Freedoms. Okay, next please. <clears throat> and I did the uh, cover of Art in America uh, about three years ago. And I was able to uh, kind of call out native artists in this whole nation and say, do not dance for pay. You know, it's no, it's no more entertainment necessary for native uh, life to the white man. We need to actually be more critical and express ourselves and look back in the past in a different way. So this is the cover of the magazine and I flipped America backwards on every issue uh, of Art in America. Okay, next please. And one of my most proud projects was a diploma project at the Tata School of Art. I was, I was honored as one of the important graduates from the Tata School of Art at Temple University. I went there for the honoring and then later they asked me to make the diploma for the students. And so I made a special uh, um, monoprint and then we later turned it into a serigraph, learn, share, lead. And one was given to every graduate. Next, please. And there they're all very happy with their diplomas uh, at the graduation ceremony. Really great day, wonderful. Okay, next please. Uh, my printmaking uh, is from Santa Fe primarily. I do print in Hawaii. I also print in Los Angeles. But I, my main printer is a master printer. His name is Michael McCabe. He's a Navajo tribal member. We, I'm going there in about two weeks to make a new series of 48 monoprints. Next, please. Uh, these monoprints have been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, PS1. Uh, the latest show was called Surviving Active Shooter Custer, and it began in Site Santa Fe, in Santa Fe itself, and went to New York. Next, please. <clears throat> now these works are becoming museum collection uh, pieces. There are 48 uh, on the left. Is this, this is called Active Shooter Custer. Uh, surviving active shooter Custer. On the left is the primary print, the first print you create from the plate. And then I found that we have very little understanding of Native people in this country. So the, the understanding we have is very faint and not much color, not much life to it in a sense. So I pull a ghost off the print as the second print and I put the ghost on the right. So those are all ghost prints of the ones on the left. Next, please. So I'm ghosting every print I make now and make an installation with that. So these are all, you know, uh, political, personal observations. They're 22 by 30 inches um, on, on a, like a BFK, Reeves BFK white paper. Okay, next please. Uh, the size is probably like, I don't know, like 15 feet or something each, each big installation. These are the, um, are the ghost prints. So the second pull from the plate and the fainter kind of uh, image. Uh, Surviving active shooter Custer. Next, please. Uh, this is one that is not ghosted. It was done prior to the Custer prints. Uh, this is called Fort Supply. And uh, for Custer, he was trying to find the Cheyenne kill them uh, for years, and he almost died himself. He could not find them and get back to the fort like Fort Leavenworth uh, in very good condition. So they built him a fort to restock him. 
and then go forward to go try to kill them um, in the winter, uh, 1868. And so that was the Washita massacre. So this is all uh, dealing with Custer's army and then how it came forward is still fighting in Afghanistan, uh, the same cavalry, air cav. Uh, so I made this piece, this is in a collection in a museum outside of Boston, the piece, uh, after shooter Custer was collected by the Museum of Modern Art. Okay, next please. Uh, this is a title piece uh, about health. Uh, the health of the people is the highest law and it deals with health issues uh, in native life, which are very, very grave, very, very serious. We, we've had such a troubling time uh, and uh, uh, all these years after contact. Uh, so the, the COVID is a new thing for many people, but we've had a disastrous health uh, event uh, all the time. Uh, next, please. Uh, at the Plaz, he was bonus vein. So I've given you a couple um, details. Uh, so the plasma place is where you sell your blood or your plasma. And if you can go often, if you're sort of underprivileged and you're a native person, you go there often, you can sell your blood more, more often than others. They call you bonus veins, the other, other tribal members. Okay, next please. That's sort of a cruel joke. Uh, this is a more lighthearted piece. This is a, uh, it's called Sweetheart Songs. And it deals with the 49, which is a kind of after party powwow night uh, in the prairies and other elsewhere. But these are all lyrics from songs that are sung from uh, the 1950s and forward. Um, and uh, I really like them a lot. I have all the songs myself and, and this goes back many years. So, so it's more of humorous and kind of sexy and about hooking up and whatnot. So I do work with a lot of different themes that are more personal. Okay, next please. Uh, this is Columbus Day, and I went to the Dominican Republic. I went to uh, San Domingo. I went to uh, uh, Columbus's son's home and, f and looked at the artifacts and the sensitivity of slavery, insensitivity of slavery. Uh, so I made a whole piece called Columbus Day. Uh, 48 prints. Uh, these are primary on the left and ghost prints on the right. Next, please. Uh, a detail, uh, second Monday in October, celebrate sadness. So we do have the Indigenous Peoples Day, but they still call it Columbus Day on the, on the calendar as well. So it's a very, very tragic uh, day to encounter. Next, please. And Columbus cut off your tongues and ears and noses. The Taino, Arawak, Carib, uh, they couldn't find the gold. They were mutilated. Next, please. Uh, one of the most recent projects was about water. Uh, water is your only medicine. And uh, I really like this project a lot. I just finished it about maybe four months ago. And it's all done in blue. So I'm changing the colors now from red to different colors of, of, of ink in Santa Fe. And uh, uh, primary prints on the, on the left and ghost prints on the right. You see me standing there, it's kind of a scale, the size of this kind of a museum size installation. Okay, next please. Uh, so the fluid inside of a mother's womb uh, in which baby rests and grows. So, so water, rain, oceans, all these uh, feelings of, of the liquid that is so precious. Next please. The most recent project uh, deals with uh, immigration, like my billboard I showed you. Uh, the title is Why is Immigration Dictated by, by Foreigners? And uh, I use more dark colors, browns and blacks, and kind of a more looming, kind of depressed um, messaging with the color. Uh, and I finished this probably about a month ago, maybe, maybe two months ago. I've been very busy, I'm very active, and I have a lot of ideas. And, uh, so on the left are the primary prints, on the right, the ghost prints. Um, and this is very, it hadn't been, hadn't been exhibited anywhere yet, I don't think, this piece. Next, please. And uh, this could be about the election that we're having right now, um, but very, very sad government action. Next, please. And uh, we're coming to the end of the talk, uh, and I wanted to certainly 
relay of that natives survive in spite of the empire. We have a lot of tragic history, but we will survive. We have survived. Uh, next, please go to the next slide. And we survive with the sage, with the ceremony, with the family, uh, with the renewal, uh, with the natural elements. We've always had those. We always will have those. And it's a big responsibility to, to carry that on. Next slide, please. And my family, my wife, Shanna Ketchup People Birds, a PhD in uh, critical studies uh, dealing with native performance in Canada and the USA, Navajo tribal member, professor, and my daughter, Desba, my woman, Heap of Birds in the center, 11 years old now, and a uh, wonderful, wonderful child. My editorial there, but uh, and we were together all the time and uh, we survived together. And now we want to share the video, brand, brand new video called. Uh, uh, Spirit Citizen, it's a two minute video, then we can have questions and discussion. I always talk about how painting doesn't ever stop. And the painters never quit painting, even when they're not painting. I mean, they're, they're gonna go back and make that progression extend further. They should be exploring with the medium, you know, and reorganizing the configurations and the exploration and investigation. You gotta articulate the ideas through a form, exploring new ways to articulate those shapes. doesn't care about humans. The earth has nothing to do with humans. And it's fine on its own, and it's been fine on its own. And, and you can kind of damage a little bit of things, but only as it pertains to humans. Like if you mess up the ozone, we get more sunburn. Or if you poison the water, we can't swim in it or drink it. It's spun before, it's gonna spin after. But but people relate more to each other. And they think and they think they're getting something done because they relate to each other. And then someday the earth will move, tilt a bit, and get close to the sun, and there'll be no more people here. And that's why the, the tribes are so, have so much humility. We pay homage to where we are. That's what, that's what we do every day on this planet, is that we don't, we're not bigger than it or more smarter than it. We just, we're happy to be kind of hosted by it. Well, we're on the the allotment uh, the north allotments north uh, Arapaho family allotments my mother's and her relatives. I moved here in the 80s the early 80s and I my great-grandmothers they were very generous and allowed me to live uh, at the top of the hill and it hadn't, it didn't have any running water and no electricity, and it was a three-room kind of old house. But but living here was a was a real privilege, and learning from the land, the weather, the animals, and again that wasn't easy. But uh, I think it puts me in a good position to always be comfortable on the planet. You know, like I'm I'm comfortable wherever we are. But I made, I made a lot of the work, actually the work that the Whitney collected was made out here, you know. And a lot of the work that I've got being shown in museums and so forth, uh, major museums in the world, was made out here. And it still resonates. Like, like every shape should be an, an entity when you're painting to me. Like every shape you make should be like a little animal spirit or it should have that weight it's not an embellishment. It's like this tree is something. 
and you know, you know, like you look at a tree, you touch it or whatever. It's like you gotta be like that tree's gotta be have as much awesome. status as anything out here, you know. And then you overlay it, you know, overlay it, overlay it, and then you get this. Like here, you get this strata of all this visual beauty, and uh, but it, it comes from being in this environment for you know years and a daily basis. It's become a, a language, a visual language for me a visual language that can be repeated and I can explore anywhere, but, but it comes from the experience of being on the land as a young, young man and, and just continuing that, that relationship you know, in, in the work as well, as well as in physicality, but also in the, in the work, it's gonna, the homage to the, to the earth is gonna be present. You know, as an artist, they need to be, live in a place that they can learn in. They need to be somewhere living on this earth that they pick, that they can learn. Not the hippest place or the funnest place or the most money money place, or but you want to learn where you're, where you're sitting and sleeping every night. Where <laughs> you need to learn. So it trickles down into being something very significant if you understood where you where you're sleeping, where you're living, and be you know citizens of that place and and take care of the spirit of those places. <laughs> Red bird. Edgar, thank you very much. Um, that was tremendous. And there's, I've got pages of notes here um, on for my, my own personal reading after this. I'd like to remind everybody, uh, submit any questions you have in using the Q&A feature and we'll definitely get to those. Um, there was a lot of uh, comments in the chat, just people very excited. Um, and I, I wanna go back to and, and start with a couple of questions that I had from earlier on although I think I'm kind of stuck on that learn where you're living uh, and we'll be thinking about that quite a bit. I think that's a lesson, not just for artists, but for everybody um, that uh, I think is really important. Um, I, I had a question for you uh, and this, somebody asked about this in the chat as well. Numbers, numbers come up quite a bit in your work, whether it be the new paintings a series and in, in, in series of four. Um, and I know that a lot of your mono prints uh, come out in series of 16 or 48. Can you speak to, to numbers and, and how has that evolved in your work and, and where does that come from for you? Well, that, that comes from the ceremonial <clears throat> life and, um, and it's touchy to how, how much to interject sure. a religious aspect into, into your practice. So I, I was led by the numbers uh, and, and, I, and to me, they're bigger i mean they're like events but but they could just be like four or 16 like songs and and so i i've, I've kind of been steering my my life through through the the count and um and so i always have the divisible kind of four 16 or 48 um and and the, for me that's really about balance you know i think i think for me that if i have that i have my balance and um something that can reflect back into the to the culture, but it's, it's sort of subliminal, you know, too. Right. Um, and I guess I may, maybe this is in the same sort of vein there, but I, I wondered, um, you know, from very early on and looking at a lot of your work, um, the same is the same go for mirrored text. There's a lot of reverse text or mirrored text uh, that comes up in, in your work uh, from very early on from some of those first text paintings that you showed us through some of the signage uh, and, and even continuing into the work you're doing now. Well, yeah, the, well, the, the native host series <clears throat> starts, you know, with the provinces or states being reversed to, to look, to, if you could turn the whole state of New York backwards and have them look, look at their past in the, in a true way, well, rather than, like when I, when I went there, it hit me because I asked for some research and then the, the people that were there with the public art fund 
and the scholars gave me stuff, stuff about the Dutch. And they said, the Dutch invented New York. Like they, the, the Dutch <laughs> invented Long Island Sound. They, uh, not really, no, they didn't. But but that's all, that's all they had, you know? And I, I had to sort of like push them harder. But they never really came across them around. And that's been kind of the case all over uh, Canada and the USA, like they don't really look so much. There's some there's some land acknowledgements now, which is kind of a new thing, but uh, people don't look very far back at the, the the founding nations that made this country. So, so and then and a critic one time uh, in New York uh, had a kind of interesting observation, where he took my reverse uh, text, and he 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 interpreted it as you were on the wrong side of the story. Like if if it's backwards to you, then you're on the wrong you're on the wrong <laughs> side of the history, you know. Which which I like that too. But that that was I, that's not my intention. But but that can be something as well, you know. Yeah, I think that often uh, people look back only as far as they want to look back, um, and so that's a it's a really I like both of those sort of interpretations there. Um, the, they look back when they can see themselves, right? You know, when they can't see themselves, then it's, it it's, it doesn't exist. Well, that kind of goes back to learn where you're living, um, which is, you know, it, where you're living existed before you live there. Um, so Anne has a question here, which is, um, how has your activism changed over the years? Is it different than when you were a younger artist listening to the Sex Pistols and living in New York? And um, how how's your activism evolved? Well, well, it's... Um... I still have, I have a lot of empathy, you know, and I, and I watch, I've been watching what's happening the last week and, and, uh, you know, I have a lot of, a lot of sentiments and a lot of, uh, angst about this nation and, and, uh, and particularly in native people's, uh, kind of tragic status in this, in this whole, this whole quandary. Um, so I'm always going to make work about it. I, mean, I'm, I, I, the, the new, the new project is about a native, a native, uh, view of ecology. And I've I've already have four I have over 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 twenty four messages already written and uh, I have to get it down to twenty four to make forty eight. But the the the, the project's called uh, "Our Red Nations Were Always Green," and uh, it'll just go into my my view of ecology and priorities. You know, so I, I think you know the the activism um, is a little problematic in terms of just being called an activist. I, I'm I don't go out and pick it or this and that, but I but I do have a lot of empathy, and I will make a I'll make effective movements, like with the billboards and the voting sign, and um, but it's about being more uh, of a contributor, and and a big part of that for me, the biggest part is I'm I'm an instructor in the ceremony, I have a young man who's in his 30s, and I'm 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 his instructor for four years, and so we passed through two years together already. And so it's not like theory, you know, I mean, there's no theory in what I make. It's like real. We've got to live this thing real and make, and make it happen for everybody, whether it's some 70 year old lady, man, teenage kids, or, you know, you, you got to really fight that, that uh, battle of not being exclusive as an artist. It's not about being rich and famous or whatever. Like, and very few artists work with children. I mean, they, uh, people that are prominent, they never so they see that as a lower thing or elders. Are, and you know, that's the best thing you could ever do is work with elders and children. And not every day, but I think you know you have to be effective and share what you've got. And uh, so, so it's more like face to face, hand to hand kind of uh, contact. Yeah, I, uh, there's just a comment that came through from Fawn, who I, I happen to know is an artist, um, who says that activists should be the norm, being human. And I think that that being an artist is also just an expression of being human. Um, in that same vein, um, the, the question came up, and I, I kind of wondered about this because I've seen, seen a couple of your, your presentations, um, and they often start, you know, as you're already an artist, but when, when did you know that, that art was going to be the path that would take you, and what was your experience or relationship with art as a younger child before going to school and before pursuing a more formalized path there? Well, that's a great question, and uh, like my daughter is uh, like a natural. You know, she she carries her sketchbook everywhere. I mean, 
it's almost like a safety net to her in a way. I mean, she she likes to respond to her drawings and she sees her life in in the drawings, you know. And um, but I was a kid like that, and uh, I, I I always say I got a scholarship to Art Institute when I was in third grade. <laughs> so a third grader went Art Institute. I like yeah. drawing with charcoal, like crazy uh, spheres and cones and things. Like, what the heck does that mean? But but I, I was there in the studio with the, all the other people making these charcoal drawings, and uh, and I don't think that really mattered. But but that was a distinction. Sort of said, well, he's always drawing in his books. Maybe he's got something there. Uh, and every, and everyone in the home made something too. It's sort of kind of a community tribal kind of thing where everyone's going to be actively like me and my daughter made pumpkins for my mom. And we, if we go to the house for Halloween, we're all make some draw some crazy pumpkin faces and put them out somewhere, you know, it's just like a natural thing you do. Um, right. But then going to college was a big point and high school was a big point. And I had good instruction. I had some of the best art teachers in the world. And I, I have to say that for sure that they helped me, but, um, but I wasn't there to do that. I was there to become a, more of a laborer than my father was. And so that was my mission to work on cars or something or, which I can do a little bit <laughs> today. I don't want to do that, but, uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, I moved off of that into, into design. And um, then design told me, they said, uh, you probably get out of here because you're making too many paintings. You know, you're always making these beautiful things. And we want, we want designers to make stuff for, for clients. And, and so that was good, good news. But now I make all this work about art with words. You know, so I'm still designing. Yeah, I think that there's something really great. Uh, the the monoprints walk a very fine line between design and and paintings. Um, the the spray and sort of the bubbling effect that you get um, feel very painterly, and at the same time, the the heavy use of text and heavy line to convey messages is very design oriented. So it's really interesting to hear that you have that history in design that is so very similar, uh, or that that carries through, and. I, this is just a really quick question because I have like another one that came through that that's really interesting for me. But um, you talked about this next series and thinking about ecology. Um, and I, you know, is, is that series going to potentially be green? We we see you work in red most of the time. And then you you had the water series, which was in blue. Uh, there's the the one series that's in black and white. Um, are we bringing it around to the fourth color? <laughs> green ink right now we're, we're getting the shop of green ink studio is, uh, and it'll be many kinds of greens and then we're then you know and, and i didn't talk about this in the lecture but there's not much time but uh we're very we're focused on the paper also and so i'm in new york and brooklyn is a great paper place called talus t-a-l-a-s one of the best paper places on the on the planet and uh it's just kind of this little alley street in brooklyn on the way to LaGuardia, but uh <clears throat> they have wonderful paper and so we buy, I buy like 12 different colors of, of paper there. And um, and so when we go to the ghost, we've got the different colors of green that came on the white, leaves B of K, the 24. When we ghost that that green, we're gonna pull it onto a blue, a gray, like a butcher paper, brown. We, we've got all these colors. So that even flips it even more, changes it and they're kind of, you know, my, my theory is kind of getting a little bit washed out because they're getting more beautiful. <laughs> these these <laughs> ghosts are really nice. They're really nice. And so, yeah. and I can't help it. We're going to make some beautiful work. And people say that. People say, and I like it before I even read it, you know, and and that's good. We're, we're, we're getting more deeper and deeper. And you got to investigate in your process all the time. You're always investigating. And so I'm all about finding, you know, what to make and how to make it and change it up and keep keep uh, progressing. So we're gonna do that with, with this ecology series. Very, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I feel like there's also something really uh, resonant about the idea of a ghost uh, print and I'm, I'm familiar with it you know, through printmaking as well. Um, I think there's something that, <clears throat> excuse me, to your point, can be more powerful or potent in the retelling of a story, in the ghost of a story that gets more beautiful and more poignant as we move forward. Um, there is that significant moment of the initial print and then the, the echo uh, has, has power. Uh, and sometimes the power builds uh, in that way. 
So Fawn has a question for you, and uh, I should say this is from uh, the artist Fawn Douglas, who's a, a Native American artist based here in Nevada, whose work is also on view at the Nevada Museum of Art right now in the in the Flow exhibition. Fawn says, do not dance for pay. I've made work with a similar message. We don't dance for money in regards to powwow culture. Was your work in relation to powwow or does do not dance for pay mean something different to you? Uh, it means more about the art business, I guess. You know, that, that you've had so much, so much damage, you know, about the, the, the folklore distraction. That's what I had in the first one of the first slides. Like <clears throat> we've had so much folklorical uh, imagery, and then uh, you know I don't want to let them off the hook, but the settler culture has been pretty ignorant, uh, and they're insensitive. But no one taught them anything either. <laughs> you know, like they go to the gallery and there's all these happy pottery, rug, whatever, buffaloes, and and then and then you go to the bar after the opening, and all the I mean the bars are griping about white society. You know, they they give you the editorial you know, when you meet them privately, but they never put in their work because they're, they're, they're afraid to displease the collector, you know. And uh, so so I, I blame the artists on a big part of, of what they've been selling, dancing for pay. And, and of course, we had that horrible uh, um, mascot at the University of Oklahoma. He was called Little Red, and he actually danced after every football touchdown. And uh, one of them was even Cheyenne. He was a Cheyenne student. And they still have a covered wagon that drives out after every touchdown. They've right. got guns that go off. So if you're, you're so complicit in that, you know, but you were acknowledged, but as a clown, you know, and, uh, and so I, I had a hard time teaching there because of that. But um, so we have to really challenge that and we have to look at our, police ourselves and really get it down to where we're saying something that's, you know, significant. Um, and so that for so the, the powwow thing, uh, that, that's a, you know a little bit about that, but I, I find for me I don't go to big powwows. I go to the ones on the reservation where I live, and but they're, more, they're more like benefit dances for a graduation or a birthday, memorial. I go to events that are about community uh, acknowledgement, and and I, and I and I love that. I mean I I go and dance all, I dance every day. Uh, it's wonderful. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh... I immediately thought of a Fawn's piece that's on view in the exhibition right now that directly references powwow culture when I saw that. Um, and I think that it, there's something, you know, again, going to the, the mono prints in general in how they are, they are so very targeted and yet open-ended. Um, and, and to see that on the cover of Art in America so directly is, is really, really powerful. Um, I know that we've gone way over time here, but I, there's one last question, and I had this question as well, and Joanne um, has asked it, um, which is, what was the reason that, um, and this kind of goes for Dancing for Pay, I, I think in some ways in that, uh, what was the reason that the Koch administration gave for censoring the art? It, was, it, was it not friendly enough for, for the city of New York? The word I got, it was uh, too many tribes. <laughs> too many tribes around the around his park, like it, but his office was in the middle of it, right? And there was always an innocuous sculpture, big silver balls, and all kinds of things that were allowed to go. But but having twelve tribes, uh, and, and of course, I'm I'm making a reclamation. I'm making a political point, and I'm kind of insulting New York at the same time, you know. But um, but but it, it was disallowed, and the and the public art fund wasn't very helpful with that. So it was good to kind of come back and put it back out. But I want to have it permanent, you know. So a lot of the pieces are permanent. I have University of British, British Columbia. I have twelve panels that are permanent. UBC, and uh, you know we have that KU. We have them all around like Pittsburgh College. We have them all over. So it'd be nice to go back and have something in New York uh, permanent as well, you know. But uh, but the mono prints, I'm really excited about the mono prints, and and uh, it's all about the exploration and investigation uh, and making something beautiful, but. My favorite painter is Jackson Pollock, and I want to go to Museum of Modern Art. I'm in the collection, so I get a free pass when I go to when I go to MoMA. They, they let me they let me come in, you know. So I go sit before everyone comes and watch the Pollocks, and so if I can have a message to present, I would I do that with the Mono Prince, but in a in a in a in the the painterly language of, of of strips and splats and so on, you know. And so I have to be explicit to get things done as a native artist. So it's a, it's a very good marriage to have that beautiful 
flow of paint, but also have a very explicit uh, text message. So that's what I've come to. Yeah, um, we're going to wrap up here in a second, but it, that actually reminded me when you when you spoke of that that you um, you you noted how proud you were to to see your painting hung next to painting by Bryce Martin, um, who you you referenced really quickly as not a colleague, and I was I wrote a note down that said definitely a colleague. You guys are are in the same vein, and I could see a series of the mono prints with the the lines and the wandering the spray and the splatter and the color uh, being very in the same vein and, and worthy of being in the same galleries. So uh, I, I would just, we're going to end with that. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to thank you again, Edgar. This has been really tremendous and um, I've, I've really enjoyed it and having the opportunity to, to talk with you. I want to thank everybody who joined us today um, and everybody who hung in for a, a little bit longer of a talk. Um, Again, I'd like to thank the Nevada Humanities and the Core Humanities Program at the University of Nevada, Reno for sponsoring this program, uh, as well as uh, thank the Jordan D. Schnitzer Family Foundation uh, for their support and for loaning work that's on view right now at the Nevada Museum of Art and the World Stage Exhibition where you can go see um, uh, work by, by Edgar Heapabertz, uh, as well as the, I would definitely encourage people to go and check out the uh, Prototypes for New Understanding show, which is currently up, I think just through this weekend, um, and I, I, it's tremendous work that everybody should get a chance to see if you're in the Northern Nevada area. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Edgar. Thank you, Joanne Northrup, uh, Stacey Montu. Thank you very much for joining us and, uh, and welcoming Edgar to the Great Basin. Edgar, uh, come and see us sometime when, when travel's more able to happen. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you, Thank you so much, Edgar. Thank you, Stacey. Right. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Have a great afternoon.